Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, part two, making a palette for a folding knife. So a couple weeks ago, I showed the design phase of making a pallet fixture for uh, my CNC machine for a folding knife prototype that I'm working on right now. So in the first half, it was all design. It was all on Fusion 360 showing how I, I was laying out the uh, pallet and kind of the strategy that I was using. If you haven't seen that one already, uh, I've got a, a link in the card so you can check it out there. Otherwise, let's jump right on into it and we will see how we actually go about machining it. As I mentioned in my earlier video, the fixture is built using the Pearson pallet system, which allows pallets to be swapped out and locked onto a pneumatically operated base. The pallets themselves can be machined to accommodate all kinds of jobs. In this case, I'll be drilling and profiling the blades, as well as some of the other pieces of the knife, all on the top of the pallet. I'll also be roughing out the bevels on the front surface of the fixture. I'll begin by using what's known as an adaptive clearing strategy to rough out a pocket to accept blanks for the knives. They'll be attached using a small clamp known as a Mighty Bite Pit Bull Clamp. Those clamps will fit into a second, slightly deeper slot machined in front of the first. The simplest way to cut slots like this would be to just blast away in a series of straight lines. Back in the day, that's how CNC programs would have typically worked. But not anymore. The idea with an adaptive clearing strategy is to keep as even a chip load on the tool as possible. In other words, so it's chopping out a little chip each time that's exactly the same or really close to the same as the previous chip. This causes less wear on tools and ideally cuts at a faster rate throughout the cut. Now I'll drill a series of pilot holes in preparation for tapping the holes to admit various bolts that will hold the material in place. First, I'll spot all of the holes with a quarter inch spotting drill. Then I'll drill 201 thousandths for the quarter 20 holes that will hold titanium for the lock bars and micarta G10 or other material for the spacers. Then I'll drill 0.187 or 3 16 holes for shoulder bolts that will retain the blade stock I've drilled at the top of the pallet. Then in the bottom of those shoulder bolt holes and in the deeper slot, I'll drill 0.136 or number 29 pilot holes. These will then be tapped for 832 threads. Those threads will hold the pit bolts in as well as holding the bottoms of the shoulder bolts. The advantage of using a shoulder bolt in a fixture like this is that it allows you to bolt things to a closer tolerance than if you use just a regular old bolt. I'll tap the holes using a hand drill. The Tormach can do tapping operations, but I find that it's generally easier to tap things like this by hand if you're only doing a few. I'm using a spiral flute tap and the clutch set to a safe torque position on the drill so I can just crunch on into the end of the hole pretty safely without snapping the tap. You'd be amazed at how quickly you can tap this way. Now comes the interesting part. I'll remove the Pearson's base 
replacing it with a Kurt milling vise. I've machined some blocks or chocks, I don't know what you want to call them, with faces at 5 degrees that will support the fixture at a 5 degree angle, which is the angle of a new face that I'm going to be milling onto the front of the pallet. This corresponds to the angle of the bevels on the blade, allowing the bevels ultimately to be machined with an end mill. The key to making all this work is to indicate everything really carefully so that everything's nice and square. If anything's off by even the tiniest amount, the pallet will replicate those mistakes every time the part is machined in the future. So you've got to get it right now. Now I'll face off the front surface of the pallet. There will be two positions used here when the pallet's complete, one for each side of the blade, allowing each side to be beveled at five degrees. Again, we'll be drilling shoulder bolt holes to secure the blades. Same procedure as the top, spot, drill for the shoulder portion, drill again for the pilot hole of the screw. In the future I may ream the shoulder bolts, allowing me to get really tight clearances so that they don't move around in the hole. But the way the pallet's been designed, it's not really necessary. The really tight tolerances are all machined in the first operation so that all the looser tolerance operations are left for subsequent parts of the machining. Now I'll use a 3 8 inch ball end mill to machine a support surface corresponding to the bevel of the blade so that when the second bevel is milled you won't get chatter or deflection caused by machining an extremely thin and unsupported blade. finish up by tapping the 832 threads. A little bit of hand cleanup, some chamfering and that sort of thing, and it'll be ready to roll. The beauty of this setup is that if you're not producing large numbers of parts, you can just set them up operation by operation on the pallet. Or, if you really need to crank out a bunch of parts, you can run multiple pallets, setting the idle pallets up while one of them is running, then swapping them out as you go. The Pearson pallet system is theoretically repeatable to 3 ten thousandths of an inch, so you can work to pretty tight tolerances without having to re-indicate or fuss around with each pallet when you swap. At least that's the theory. So there are very few topics that I do that seem to polarize people more than stuff related to CNC. Some people love it, some people uh, actually just hate it. Um, you know, I understand both perspectives, but the thing that I would always say is that the more that you learn about the craft as a whole, the more that you can bring to bear on whatever kind of problem you're working on, whether you're you know, making forged knives, whether you're making stock removal knives, um, making them uh, with mills and other complicated machinery, whether you're making them with files, doesn't really matter. The more you know, the better you get. Uh, the thing that I think is most significant about uh, showing something like, uh, like I was doing today is that 
Anytime you're trying to make more than one of anything, it's really helpful to have fixtures that will hold that thing down and allow you to repeat certain operations in a little bit more efficient and hopefully more accurate and high quality way. So personally, I just like seeing lots and lots of different ways of, of fixturing things. There's so many different ways, so many different tools, so many different kinds of little clamps and just all kinds of different things. And the more that you see of these kinds of uh, fixtures, the more you can say, oh, that's you know something there that I can pull out that I can take back to my shop and it's going to help me solve a problem. Thanks for watching guys. If you feel like you got something out of this video, don't forget to subscribe. Also, click on the link to Patreon for a great way to give back to the channel. Plus, check me out on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Links in the description. If you want something sharp and pointy, maybe a gift for yourself or one of the cooler people in your life, check out my Tactics Armory website and pick up one of our tactical or outdoor knives. And finally, if you want to learn to make hamons or Japanese swords, check out waltersorrelsblades.com where you can find videos about how I make hamons as well as forging, mounting, polishing, and fittings for Japanese swords. Thanks and see you soon!